morning. I will not spend too much time speaking preliminary. We're going to go to the book of 2 Timothy, the 4th chapter, the 10th verse. I will say to those that made it to camp meeting, what a time we had this week at camp meeting. And I pray that you were blessed by all the ministry that was given. Tremendous word of God was given Wednesday night and then Thursday night and Friday night. And we're thankful for your participation. In fact, Wednesday night, I think we had about 30, 35 folks from Peace Tabernacle at camp meeting. Amen. I think there may have been churches that were closer that didn't have that many folks. And uh, it did my heart good to uh, to see everybody. And Amen. Oh, yeah. Mama Mia came in, Sister Valle, she came in, she had a whole herd of people with her. And uh, I pray that they receive something from the Lord. Praise God. Second. Regardless, 
amen, of how we were to look at it. Paul seems to have been deeply hurt by him leaving, stating that he had been forsaken. And I'm going to tell you something this morning, that living for God is not always the easiest thing to do. It isn't always the most popular thing to do. But you have to come to a time in your life where you make up your mind where you stand and what price you're willing to pay. You've got to make it up in your own mind. I'm willing to pay the price no matter what the cost. I see in Dima somebody who looked looked at the situation and realized that, uh, you know, I could lose my life if I stick around Paul. And so I better get out of town. And sometimes that's the way it is in us, in our living for God, is that, you know, we begin to look at what it's going to cost us. Uh, amen. And we say, you know what, I'm not willing to pay the price. I'm not willing to give everything. I'm not willing to sell out and give it all. And so because of a love for living in this present world, you turn away from the things of God and you turn away from, amen, those things that mean so much to the Lord. And I did not tell Brother Bacchus what I was going to be preaching on this morning. I never do. And yet, uh, amen, I love it when he gets up here. You get your Sunday morning Bible study with Brother Bacchus, and I love it. Praise God. It's a great introduction to what I'm going to preach. In fact, it allows me to turn the teacher off in me and put the preacher on, because you already got taught something. Now I can just preach. But you got to have a made-up mind. You've got to believe that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. You've got to believe it in your spirit that we're only sojourners uh, in this place. Uh, amen. And too many times uh, people want to put roots down in this world. But only time you're ever going to put roots down is when they put you in the ground. Amen. And so we've got to have a made up mind that no matter what the cost, I'm going to live for God. People may talk about me, but I'm going to live for God. People may make fun of me, but I'm going to live for God. People may call me a holy roller, but I'm going to live for God. They may call us ladies weird because we dress modestly in an immodest age. If it's not for sale, don't advertise it. Well, that was even that wasn't even in my notes, but I felt like saying it this morning. If it's not for sale, you don't need to put it out there for everybody to see. Amen. If I read my Bible right, the Bible says that my wife's I'm just gonna please plain spoken, but my wife's body's for me. And if it's for me, I don't want her sharing it with everybody else. Well, praise God anyhow. We got to be willing to make up our mind that we're going to pay the price. That we're going to do what it takes to make heaven our home. Whether it's popular or unpopular. When you make up your mind, you're willing to sell out to everything. You can't tell me that others haven't done it before. I know a guy who was a Golden Gloves boxing champion. Amen. Was personally trained by his daddy. Amen. Every day run five to ten miles. I get tired just thinking about it. Every day. Every morning. Go practice. Go work out. Get up in the morning. Go run. Then come to school. And then after school, get up and run out to the gym and work out for two or three hours. And then run home. There was no riding in no car for him because he was in training. But when God filled him with the Holy Ghost. I can't do that lifestyle and live for God. And so he said, I'm giving it up. Because 
you got to make up your mind what you're going to do. You got to make, can you do what you're doing? Can you live the lifestyle you're living and live for God? Hallelujah. Too many times, uh, amen, we want to say uh, it's all right for me to live this way and live for God. Uh, but the word of God is plain uh, and the word of God is plain spoken. Uh, amen. And you're going to have to choose you this day whom you will serve. You got to make up your mind. I'm willing to pay the price. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment in Cananet for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I underlined, I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country victory or death and this was written by Colonel Travis at the Alamo it is stated knowing that the enemy is near in fact history records that while he was seeing the enemy come around he he drew a line in the sand and said, I, I refuse to surrender and I refuse to retreat and I refuse to give up without a fight. And whoever's with me crossed the line and man after man, knowing the cost, uh, would be great, crossed the line, uh, refusing to give up that point of independence and that point of fight. Uh, and even though they were overwhelmed and even though it cost them everything, they stood. It became a cry for freedom for all of those that are in our current Texas. Uh, remember the Alamo. Remember Goliad. And because of that war cry, other men stood up and fought for our independence. They knew the cost was death. And yet, they fought on. I feel like we're at a point where we're going to have to draw a line in the sand. And say, who's going to live for the Lord? And who's going to forsake Him for this present world? Amen. Who's really willing to die out to the things of this world? And give up the things of this world? And say, I'm willing to give everything I have for the cause of Christ. Again, Brother Bacchus did not know my message. And yet yesterday, I was up here studying. So I put this together yesterday before, amen, I ever stepped to the place this morning. Uh, and I am telling you today, the spirit of compromise is all around us. Uh, amen. And men that used to stand for something have been taken captive by an enemy uh, that has allowed deception to become their bed partner. And now they walk in a mind that is of the world more so than the mind of God. Uh, we don't need God. God speak. We need a move of God. We don't need men that just knows religion. We need men that will get in the preach of the pulpit. Thus saith the Lord. Come on, I feel a, I feel a spirit of the enemy. Hey Amen. I can tell you that I am I'm bumping up against things that uh, hey man, I've never bumped up before and the enemy stirred up and the enemy's riled. Uh, I went to a saint's house last night that's not well in their body and as sure, sure as I know myself I know as I was stepped out of the vehicle to go pray for that individual the enemy of the Lord spoke against me and said preacher what are you doing at this house uh, you don't belong here I said devil I rebuke you and all the minions that are with you I'm tired of you tormenting my saints. I'm tired of you having dominion in their home and I'm going to start taking a stand against it with everything within me That's the way I believe it. 
So it's no surprise to me at 2.30 this morning, hey amen, I had a dream, a dream that was so shocking me that I, I woke up uh, and I, I could just feel a presence. I had to get up and pray a little bit, uh, amen, because I just knew it was just unsettling. Uh, and in this dream, Brother Waddy, there was an individual, a uh, man, it was, and I identified it as a spirit, and he was taking fruits off the vine and throwing them on the ground. And he just says, you know what, I'm discontentment. And in the dream, Sister Bumgarner and I were there, and we, could, we felt somebody was at our place. And I walked out to this building, and there was nobody there. There was nothing there. And then I turned around, I was going back to the house, but Sister Bumgarner, hey amen, didn't come with me. And so I stopped, and I turned around, and I said, wait, what's going on? And I, I go back, and all of a sudden, I see her being hurled across the room. She's crying out. And I come around and there's this spirit again. And I said, I knew it was you. And he whips out a weapon to use against me and I come against him in the name of Jesus. I'm telling some of you, you need to kick discontentment out the door. It's a thief that is robbing you of what God has for you. Stop trying to find contentment in the things of this world and get content in the things of God. Come on, the enemy's going to use you up and spit you out. He doesn't care about you. He wants to steal from you and rob from you, but I promise you, uh, as long as there's breath of life in your pastor's wife uh, and in your pastor, we will battle for your soul. We got to get to the place. Uh, amen. Uh, now, I know some of you have talked to me, and I'm not saying this because you talk to me, but you got to understand, this is our field of labor. This is where God has called us. Uh, this is where God has put you. Uh, amen. And if the enemy can get you into a place of discontentment, uh, wishing you could be somewhere else, uh, amen, that he's got you neutralized uh, from what God wants you to do. Uh, but when you begin to say, get thee behind me, Satan, this is my home. Uh, this is my family. Uh, this is my church. Uh, and this is my city. Uh, and I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure uh, that Warden Texas uh, is reached uh, for the kingdom of God. Uh, and I'm going to do everything within me uh, to reach the city that God has put me in. Hey. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I stand up today understanding that we fight not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers of darkness. And therefore, I concur with our elder, Brother Bacchus, in the fact that uh, we have spiritual warfare to do today, that we need to fight the spirits of the enemy and not one another. Right. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. We've got to make up our mind. This is where God has called us. This is the lifestyle God has called me to live. Amen. Amen. Oh, there are some things that I preach and teach. Amen. Because an elder put a landmark down. Proverbs 23 and 10. Remove not the old landmark. And enter not into the fields of the fatherless. For their redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. And what that scripture is letting me know that if you begin to remove the landmarks, that the Redeemer is going to have a word with you. And there are some things, uh, amen, you can say, well, it's not a heaven or hell issue, or it really doesn't mean all that much. And you know what? I go back to honor and respect. There's some things that I'm just not comfortable doing because an elder before me prayed in an old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting and God gave them a conviction and that conviction was handed down and who am I to say, well, it doesn't matter anymore. Hey, if it was good enough for them back then, it's good enough for me now. 
because they have obtained. I have not obtained. And if I want to make it to heaven, I better grab a hold of the old landmarks and say, Lord, let me just clean up around this landmark. Let me dig the trench a little bit deeper. I don't want you to have a cause with me, Lord. Because I promise you this, that everyone that has taken a landmark and removed it, they're going to have to take it up with the Lord. There's some things that we should not touch. There are some convictions that we're not going to touch because somebody established them a long time ago. Well, yes, amen, or no, amen, it's the truth. We live in a day and age that don't like boundaries. In the church, they don't like boundaries. Now, we've been accused of being legalistic. I am not legalistic. Amen. I preach holiness. Well, praise God. I still preach men should be men. And women should be women. But we don't like boundaries in this day and age. And that spirit has crept into the church. We better be wise and weary of what's creeping into the church. And yet, amen, we need to make sure that we know what our boundaries are. Know what the fences are. Holiness is not there to hurt us. Holiness is there to help us. We live in a day and age that the world doesn't want boundaries. We, they want to live as there's no consequences. And then put on a victim's mentality when we get caught. Oh, y'all didn't hear me there. I want to do whatever I want to do, but if I do bad and I get in trouble, then, well, I was raised wrong. Mama was bad to me. Daddy misused me. He talked ugly to me. So this is what's caused me to be this way. And we bring it into the church too sometimes. Well, I can't live for God because sister so-and-so hurt my feelings or brother so-and-so told me I need to live a certain way or, hey amen, you know, I'm talking about mature people that live for God. I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about people that have lived for God for a while. Amen. We want to do what we want to do and say we still live for God, but then when God spanks us, we want to cry out and say, Lord, pray for me, Brother Bumgarner. Now, I don't mean to be unsympathetic. I'm, not, I'm very compassionate. I'm very sympathetic to people. But I was not raised in a preacher's home. I was raised in a saint's home. Just your blue-collared... Construction worker, Papa. Mama worked in the cafeteria at the high school, so I never got away with anything. Saints of God. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They drug me to youth services all over the state of Oklahoma on Fridays and Saturday nights. And if there was church, we were probably going to be there. We went to youth meetings, and we went to fellowship meetings, and we went to Sunday school rallies. We went to church. Not because the preacher was saying we had to go to church. Uh, because my parents loved God. And they wanted their children to live for God. And so we went to church. And we lived a lifestyle in our home. Not because a preacher told us to live that way. But the Lord convicted mama and daddy. And so when I dressed inappropriately. Mama said get back in that room. You ain't leaving my house looking like that. Or my sisters would come out looking a certain way. And they'd say uh, you need to change that dress. Because girl that thing's too tight. And you know we got to live right. We got to be holy. We got to be true to God. Amen. Amen. We didn't check in with the preacher every day. We checked in with Jesus every day. Boundaries weren't established in the pulpit as far much in our home as they were established by mom and daddy. Now some of y'all ain't getting that and some of you may be. But I'm going to tell you something. The boundaries in your home doesn't come from this pulpit. They come from you. I can preach the word 
Amen. Till I feel like I've stripped third gear. And if you don't heed to the word of God in your own home, it may seem like in vain, but I'm going to keep on preaching it. Whether or not you live at that job business. But you got to make up your mind today. I don't want to be like Demas. I want to be like Paul. Lord, if you want me to give everything, I'll give everything. If you want me to die at the, the chop block, I'll die at the chop block. Uh, if you want the guillotine to come down on my head, I'll, I'll so, uh, give up my head. Uh, whatever you want me to do, Lord. We need real men of God to stand up and take a stand for what's right. Hey, man, you need to check your boots sometimes and make sure you ain't got no feathers down there. Oh, I know that's offensive. Amen. I want you to know I believe the Lord can save every homosexual that's alive. He can deliver them. He can set them free. Brother Johnny James was talking to a man in an airport. And, and he said, well, you know, I was born this way. And Brother Johnny James says, you know what? I can believe that. But Jesus said, you need to be born again. It doesn't matter if you're homosexual, you can be born again. It doesn't matter if you're a whoremonger, you can be born again. It doesn't matter if you're a drug addict, you can be born again. It doesn't matter if you're an alcoholic, you can be born again. You can be changed. What I used to be, I'm no longer what I used to be. Places I used to go, I don't go there. I made up my mind. I'm going to forsake this world and cling to Jesus and go all the way. Amen. You know, some too many times the devil gets blamed for stuff that he didn't have nothing to do with. Too many times we give him credit for our own stinking flesh. Oh, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make you do it. You just didn't want to give up the world. You didn't want to forsake the world and the things of the world. So you did what you wanted to do. And then you want to come to church on Sunday morning or Sunday night and cry your crocodile tears and say, Oh, the devil made me do it. Don't think you're fooling anybody. Well, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hey, Amen. You know, I, I think the more I think about it, the more I'm thankful that I wasn't raised in a preacher's home. But sometimes, amen, preachers that are raised in a preacher's home, saints think, well, they don't have no clue about how we live. But I've been there. I've been there when they've attacked the pastor. And my daddy said, no, we ain't attacking the pastor. We're not doing that. I've been there when nobody showed up but our family. But we was there. Amen. To work on the church. Been there. Done that. Amen. In fact, I told, told Malachi, son, if the Lord doesn't call you to preach, that's fine with me. Because if you're in this business, you better be called. Because if you're not called, it'll eat you up and chew you up and spit you out. I said, but son, one thing I want you to do is be a preacher's friend. Amen. That's what I lived with, the preacher's friend. Preacher needed something done at church, dad was there. We needed to work on the church, we were there. More than I wanted to be sometimes. Can I get a witness? Because you have to lay things down to do the work of the Lord. It's not that we were not busy. Dad had a business and at the same time, Amen. We would work jobs and then go from there on lunch break and go to the church and work. And then go back to the other job. And then come back in the evening and work at the church. Doing the work of the Lord. But too many times when we do wrong, we want to blame the devil. When really it's just our stinking thinking. As Brother, Hunt, Brother uh, Huntley likes to say. It's just our stinking thinking. It's our carnality jumping up. Looking out at the world and, and, and imagining that, man, life must be so much better for everybody else. In fact, I mentioned a little bit this past week, but I was talking Monday night with a, a, a friend. And he's taught a series on, like, Facebook. And he brought some very true things to mind that 
Facebook is nothing more than what it means. Face value. A facade. Now, it's a great way to connect to people, and yet at the same time, you've got to be very, very careful. But as we begin to talk, you know, uh, he made mention of some things. Very rarely, now, you've got a few that let you know everything going on in their life. A few. But most people, they only put pictures of the good things that are happening. Oh, on vacation to, I don't know if anybody's been to Canyon Lake this year, but I'm not going to, you know, oh, we're on vacation to Canyon Lake, having a great time. Of course, they don't talk about the argument they had for two hours getting there, where they were going to park, where they were going to stay, what they were going to eat. What? I felt a witness to my right. They didn't tell when they were setting up the tent and how they got in a disagreement because they couldn't find which pole to put. You don't ever see none of that stuff. You always see pictures of people having a great, oh man, the greatest time of our life. And it creates a sense false in people's, in our own lives. With Man, look how good their life is. Man, they're living it up. Everything must be fine and dandy for them. Oh, check them out there at the club. Boy, they must be having a great time. Don't show the picture the next morning when they're puking up their guts. Now, that's just reality. Is it not? I, I want, I want to, they need a before and after picture. Show the guy with the shot of tequila at the bar. But then show him the next morning passed out in somebody's ditch not knowing how he got there. Or when they get blood poisoning from the alcohol and they're in the hospital. No, we don't show those kind of things because we, that's reality. Cirrhosis of it. I mean, we can talk about it all day long. But we only see what we want people to see. But we got to live in reality. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And I don't know how it is for them out in the world. Well I guess I do. Because they don't turn to Jesus. They turn to Jack Daniels. Or some other type of substance. Because they're going to replace God. You're going to replace God with something. You're going to replace the spirit of the Lord with something. Because you're going to have bad days. You're going to have rain clouds. I was driving out of town yesterday at 2 o'clock, 2.30. Hey, man, it was pouring down rain. I checked my phone for the weather report because I didn't think it was supposed to rain. It said sunny. I'm like, well, you can... Of course, I got up by Needville and it was sunny. But you can't always determine when the rain clouds are going to come in your life. You can't always determine when the, the storm's going to start blowing. When I got to the top, up on 59, I got to the very edge of that storm, and I looked up and I saw some clouds, and I told my wife, I said, you see that right there? That's the making of a funnel cloud. I don't know if it would do it, but I said, but that's how they start, when they first start shaping. And she's, because I'm from Oklahoma, we know a few things about tornadoes. And so I was watching it, because if, if it started dropping down any more than it already had, I was fixing a... And the top of that, the edge of the storm, I mean, the wind was blowing. And, and I, I guess I'm fascinated with storms. But I love how watching the wind just cut across you. And, of course, the vehicle is pushing you. And, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a force in the storm. But when you get out of the storm and the sun is shining, you forget all about the rain and you forget all about the wind and you forget about the things that you've gone through. And sometimes when we walk out of the rain, we just forget about how good the Lord has been to us and we just do our own thing. Amen. What is the saying? When the plane goes down, even an atheist believes. Amen. You just let one of them big old pockets of air and you're up in the air. And I'm sure some of you men that have flown for work, you know, you get up in those pockets and that turbulence and all of a sudden you just drop. Boom. 
Now, don't be scared to fly. It's still safer than going to the hospital. Or driving. Now, I hope you heard what I just said. It's more safer to fly than it is to go to the hospital. But have you ever been on one of them flights and, the, and you just drop? Amen. I'll never forget the first time Sister Bumgarner, we are flying back from Denver to uh, Oklahoma and and it was a bad flight, probably one of the worst ones I've ever been on. And I mean, it was when the flight attendants don't get up, you know you're not on a good flight. And now the Lord had spoken to her the night before and told her it was going to be a rough flight. She did not share that with me. But when we were up in the air, I heard, I heard I, two things happen. First of all, I lost circulation in my right arm because she was gripping it so tight. And then I heard, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. But you know what? The Lord had already told her it's going to be a rough flight, but I got you. But no matter when you get in a circumstance where you're not in control, there's only one place you can go for help. In fact, the psalmist wrote, I look unto the hills which cometh. My help. My help cometh from the Lord. Amen. That's one reason pastor don't like roller coasters. Because I don't have no control. It's not the going fast. I don't mind that. But when you get on that thing, you're at their mercy. Amen. And when you drop, you have no control. And my thought is, is what if that thing don't hold me in? When I fly, I want the Lord to fly me out of this place. Not some... And so I'm talking this morning because too many times, amen, we allow ourselves to be put into situations, amen, that we put ourselves there. We put ourselves in the storm. We want to blame the devil. But only thing that he can do is what God allows him to do. We put ourselves in circumstances where the enemy gets the glory. We put ourselves, amen, in circumstances where we're having to call on the mercies of God and the forgiveness of God. And too many times I hear this, amen, when people want to, want to, you know, try to justify themselves. Well, the Lord won't put more on us than we can bear. You're right. He won't, but you can. And we put more on ourselves than we can bear. And then we ask God to bail us out. And I feel like sometimes the Lord says, look, son, you got yourself into this mess. Get yourself out. Because maybe you'll learn something. If we're going to live for Jesus, then we got to understand that the boundaries and the fences, hey, man, may not, you know, they, they may not have us going back to the world, but they may get us closer to heaven. They may keep us from the things that can harm us from getting to where we're needing to go. I mean, because what is the saying? The grass is always greener on the other side. Brother Backus, I, I noticed something when I had the place out in the country. It really is greener on the other side of the fence. For about a foot, maybe six, eight inches. Right along the fence line, boy, it's nice and green. But when I step off in the pasture, sometimes it looked worse than what was over here. And sometimes we just get our eye on the good green grass, which is only about a foot deep. And too many times people are looking at the grass on the other side. Well, if I can just get just a little over there, but then when you get over there, you can't get out. And once you finish the grass, it's along the fence line. There's nothing else to eat. I'm talking in spiritual metaphors. You got to remember that Amen. No matter what side the fence is, you still got to mow the grass. It doesn't matter what side of the fence on, you, you're still going to have to pay. And I would rather be on the side of the fence with the good shepherd than on the fence that, that I have no protection. Anybody ever heard about smudge? Smudge. Smudge is an adorable black and white little lamb. He lives at Farmer Cobb's. 
He's there with his mother and many other animals. But one fine spring day, he decides he wants to see what's on the other side of the fence. And he begins to go on a glorious adventure. And he begins to experience so many wonderful things outside the fence. But then it's starting to get dark time and it's time to go home and he can't get back in to Farmer Cobb's farm. He can't get back to Mama. He can't get back to safety. And now, amen, he's hearing the howling of the wolves. And he's starting to hear the predators coming around him. And oh, how he would like to get back into Farmer Cobb's farmyard. Because, hey, when I'm there, I'm safe. Because he, while I'm there, there's that old watchdog. And if anything comes around, he chases it away. And Farmer Cobb comes out. And he, he's watching out for me. And, and I know I'm safe there. But oh, I can't get back in. Help me, help me, help me. And not only till... He is rescued by the farmer. Can it be at peace? I'm going to tell you somebody today is outside that fence of safety. Hear me this morning. You're outside the fence of safety and you need to get back in. It's real easy to, to say I'm out here and everything's okay. But I hear the sound of the hounds of hell. And they're seeking for your soul. They don't care your age. They don't care if you're a teenager. They don't care if you're a young adult. They don't care if you're in your prime. They don't care if you're a seasoned individual. They don't care. They just want to consume your soul. And you told yourself, I don't have to live for God. I don't have to live that way. Because look on the other side of the fence. Everything's so glorious. Everything's so grand. But when you get away from from that place of safety. Hey man, the enemy's there to consume you. Brother in law told me last night he, he works shift work and it's early in the morning. Sometimes he'll go in at two o'clock in the morning. And he said he was driving on the highway and, and it was in the middle of the night and he said there was a gentleman had a beer or a bottle in his hand staggering across the freeway. Not not a busy city street, but a freeway. You're traveling 70, 75 mile an hour. He said if he'd have been over in the right-hand lane, because I wasn't in a hurry. He said I just had cruise control on. He was in the left-hand lane. He said if I'd have been over there, I'd have killed him. Do you think the devil cared? He had him captive by his substance. And I wonder today, I'm reaching for somebody. I'm reaching for souls today. Because I care about the souls of Peace Tabernacle. And I believe God cares about the souls of this church. And He is desirous for everyone to make heaven. Isaiah, the 19th chapter, the first verse. Let's go to the Word of God. The burden of Egypt. Now understand in the Old Testament, Egypt is a type of the world. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt the world and the idols of Egypt the world shall be moved at his presence and the heart of Egypt the world shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the world, the Egyptians, against the Egyptians, world against the world and they shall fight every one against his brother and every one against his neighbor, city against city and kingdom against kingdom. We're living there today. And the spirit of the world, Egypt, shall fail in the midst thereof. And I will destroy the counsel thereof. And they shall seek to the idols and to the charmers and to them that have familiar spirits and to the wizards and the Egyptians. The world will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord. And a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord and the Lord of hosts. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up, and they shall turn the river far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brook shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the water shall languish. Moreover, they that had... Work in fine flax, and they that weave networks shall be confounded, and they shall be broken in the purposes thereof. All that make sluices and ponds for fish, surely the princes of zone are fools. 
the counsel of the wise counselors of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed unto Egypt the world. The princes of Zona become fools. The princes of Noth are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt the world. Even they are the, even they that are the stay of the tribes thereof. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof. And they have caused Egypt the world to err in every work thereof. As a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. I think as we begin to read this scripture, we can see a picture of the day and age which we're living in. Man cannot solve their own problems. Neither shall there be any work for the world, Egypt, which the head or tail, branch or rush may do. In that day shall Egypt, the world, be like unto women. And it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. We got to understand today that we don't have control of anything. God is in control. And just because we have not seen his wrath does not mean that we will not see his wrath. I'm sure if you took a poll of the Egyptians when Israel was fixing to leave and you asked them, does any of you fear the hand of God? Do you, does any of you Fear the hand of Yahweh? Oh no, we don't fear Yahweh. We serve Pharaoh. And yet when the death angel began to make his way through the land, the cries and the tears and the pains, and too many times we, we think because of the grace and mercies of God that it will never happen to us, that we don't have to be ready until we get good and ready. But the thing is, I better be ready when he's good and ready. As Brother Shatwell said Wednesday night, Ready or not, he's coming. Amen. But the next verse I find some, some joy in. And the land of Judah, everybody say praise. Judah means praise. Shall be a terror unto Egypt. Everybody say the world. And everyone that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. You see, I don't want this world to cause me to lose my focus on my eternal reward and dwelling place. And the world is good at that. The world is good at making us think that without the world, we would have nothing. Without this world, we wouldn't have food on the table. Without this world, we wouldn't have a job. And I'm going to tell you, if you have a job, you ought to thank God for it. If you've got food on the table, you ought to thank God for it. If you got a roof over your head, you ought to thank God for it. This world didn't give you anything. I had an employer tell me one time, now look, this job is what puts a roof over your head and I can take it away from you anytime. I said, man, you got the wrong idea. I was looking for a job when I found this one and I can find another one just like I did because God puts a roof over my head and if you want to let me go, I'm out the door, bro. I don't put my trust in the things of this world. I don't put my faith in the gods of this world. Amen. Because this world is constantly changing. Amen. You know, I had a privilege Thursday night taking Paul Paul Gilmore to camp meeting. We had a good time. And ate breakfast on the way home. 85 years young. He's lived some. But you know what amazes me? He worked for the same company 43 years. I'm not even 43 years old. And he worked for a company longer than I've been alive. You don't hear about that in this day and age. Because individuals are looking out for individuals and companies are looking out for companies. And so there's no trust, there's no faith in each other. 
Because the employer's always thinking, well, he's looking down the road for something else, and the employee's always thinking they're just looking for the next cheap hire to replace me. That's the day and age we're living in. And so sometimes the enemy tries to control us with fear. But if you're living for God, and if you're sold out to Him, and you're praising Him, you don't have to fear this world. You don't have to be afraid on your job. You, you don't have to worry. If you're living for God and you're doing everything the Lord's asked of you, you're His employee. Amen. That's the way I believe it. And He is the rewarder of them that did it, diligently seek Him. Judah is praised. And as long as I am praising God, amen, and realize this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through my treasures. My treasures. The only treasures I really need aren't in this world. I thank God for my children, but... Amen, there's some earthly treasure, but amen, I want to take them to my heavenly treasure. Amen, the house I live in, I'm constantly having to work on it. I'm having to fix things. The towel rack falls down, you got to fix the towel rack, or, or something else breaks, you got to fix it. Amen, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Too many times people are investing more in this world than they are in the world to come. But my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue like the song says. And if Judah, the Bible says that Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Judah is praise. Do you know the world fears praise and worship? Do you know the world don't like it when you begin to magnify God? And say, I know it's Sunday, you want me to work, but if you want me to work, you're going to have to let me go praise God, or you won't have an employee anymore. Sometimes you just got to make up your mind. You say, well, Brother Baumgartner, you know that. Well, yeah, I know. I've had to stand up and say that. I'm going to praise God. Because the world fears praise. In fact, Adam Clark says it like this. The fear and consternation of Egypt, the world, shall be increased when they learn what events are occurring there. And what Yahweh has purposed in regard to it. When I read that, I wanted to shout. Because when I praise God... And I magnify him. The world don't know how to control it. Because they like to control with fear and intimidation. They like to say, if you praise God, you won't get promotion. If you live this way, amen, you, you, will, you won't make it. Or if you dress this way on the job. Young lady got fired from Burger King for wearing a dress. She sued him for discrimination, got $25,000. You say, well, well, she made up in her mind. I'm not changing for you or anybody else. I wear this dress because I feel the Lord wants me to wear this dress. I'm a worshiper. I'm a praiser in this dress. Don't you ladies realize that you praise God in your modesty and the world fears it? That just went down like a bomb. You didn't hear me. I said that you worship, you praise God in the way you dress, in your modesty, in your holiness. You walk out into the midst of a world of ungodliness and immorality and immodesty. And you say, you know what? I'm in my right mind and I'm clothed and I'm godly and I'm a woman. Amen. I'm everything God wanted me to be. And the world says you can't, you're not supposed to be that way. Yeah. Don't you understand where, we're, where the world is going? And yet every time we praise God and 
magnify God. And men, every time we lift up holy hands without fear and doubting and praise God, we shake every devil in this region. Because you know, Brother Waddy, them women are so emotional, they'll praise God no matter what. I mean, they'll cry and shout, and, but you old macho men. Oh, I feel like preaching now. You know, well, we're just not emotional. Well, you sure got emotional during football season. Huh? I mean, you want to, don't tell me we're not emotional, man. Especially if you're a manly man. Can I, am I preaching this morning? Did I lose you? I mean, we like the runs, brother Waddy. We like to see a guy take, take one all the way for 80 yards, you know. Right? Oh, that's a, oh yeah. We, but what we really like is to see about a 250 linebacker light up some 200 pound quarterback. Boom! Oh, did you see that hit? Whoa! Huh? Oh, I know. Come on. That's, that's the things of this world. That's what the world does. Because they worship their gods. But, but no, this is the way it really is, right? The guy gets hit. Oh! I said. No. No, we're all. Oh, we're high five. Hey, man, did you see that? Man, he rung his bell, man. Woo! And then we come to the house of God. And we don't praise Him. We don't worship Him. I know I'm preaching to my men again about praising and worship God and leading and worship. But I promise you this, man. When we begin to praise God and lift up holy hands without fear and doubt. And we begin to lead in this sanctuary. Every, the world begins to tremble. Now wait, we had them under control. We had them worshiping the gods of this world. We had them forsaking the things of God and, and, and just worshiping our stuff. But now they're worshiping Him like they should. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when Judah begins to praise God. The Holy Ghost is going to begin to move. Revival fire will break out and people will receive the Holy Ghost and people will walk off the street uh, being drawn by the power of the Holy Ghost uh, when we begin to forsake the things of this world and begin to grab a hold of the things of God. I don't want to be a Demas. I, I don't want to forsake the things of God. I, I want a Holy Ghost revival. Hallelujah. 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 I want God to speak into people's homes. I want them to interrupt them in the middle of the night when Gideon and his 300 men were going into battle. Somebody says, well, Brother Bumgarner, we're just a little old country church, uh, you know, and, uh, hey, man, th- you know, we're just, we're only going to do so much. And, Brother Bumgarner, why are you doing this? And why are you doing that? I'm getting ready. Because God's going to send somebody to play that. God's going to send somebody to play those. And God's going to play some. We're going to have all kinds of. I, I'm believing it. I'm believing it. I'm believing it. You may not believe it, but I'm believing I'm getting ready. God, when you send them, I'm going to be waiting. I'm going to be ready because you're going to give the word. Well, we've never done things like that before. Well, you better get ready because God's about to move. Hush, I talk. Gideon, what are you doing? I'm going down in the camp. I want to hear what they're saying. Man, I had a dream last night. And man, the enemy was all around us and they were beating the tar out of us. And I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me if I'm taking script. But you know, well, that must be the hand of Gideon. Man, we're going to get ourselves whipped. And just, Gideon, he gets excited and said, hey, God's on my side. Don't you realize who's on your side? What you gonna do, Gideon? I'm gonna put some men over here. I'm gonna put some men here. And I'm gonna put some men over here. Then what you gonna do, Gideon? We're gonna get some jugs of water. And we're gonna make some noise. And we're gonna sound some trumpets. And we're gonna start praising God. But the enemy's all around you, Gideon. I know. But God already told him in advance. I'm gonna whoop him. Don't you realize the Lord's already told the devil, you mess with peace, tabernacle, you're going to get whooped. Why don't you realize that God is on your side? And 
And when they begin to praise God, when they begin to worship the Lord, amen, those Midianites begin to turn against each other. They begin to cut up on each other. Don't you realize that the devil turns on himself every time you praise God and worship him? <laughs> we got to get to praising God and magnifying God. I don't want to be like Demas. I'm not going to forsake my brothers. I'm not going to forsake my sisters. I'm sold out the whole route. I'm ready to go to heaven, whatever the cost. <laughs> Now, now I'm going to pull into what Brother Shatwell told our, our, our brotherhoods and sisters. Wednesday night, if you were there, you heard this. But he said this, the Lord is sending out, amen, a move of the Holy Ghost greater than what he did in the beginning. I told the Lord, Warden, it's Houston area. Because I drive to Houston all the time. I mean, when you need the best of care, we have to go downtown. Amen? Somebody says, you know anything about the hospital? Re- oh, I know, every- I know Memorial, Herman, Texas, Children, St. Luke's, St. John's, St. Peter's. Well, there's no such thing, so don't. But if God's going to pour out the Holy Ghost, a fresh fire in Houston, I want it to come into Wharton. But if we're going to have a Holy Ghost explosion, God required something. He said, either you will travail on your own, or I will bring you to travail. I don't want God to have to make peace tabernacle travail. I want us to travail on our own. I want us to intercede on our own. I want us to get a hold of God on our own. Oh, I pray for a burden that the church as, as individuals would just begin to grab a hold of it and come up here on your own and, and just begin to have prayer meetings together here at the church and begin to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. That the Lord would consume us uh, with the power of the Holy Ghost and use us uh, for His glory and let His will be done in us uh, because there is going to be an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But we've got to move in it. Lackadaisical, unconcerned, prideful, boastful saints of God are not going to do it. Amen. And we, 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 we do too much show in this day and age and it just bothers Brother Bumgarner. And I'm not an old... I mean, I'm not... I feel like I'm an old man sometimes, but I'm only 42. But I recall the days when the power of God moved and it wasn't based on a bunch of show. And yet I told Sister Bumgarner, our problem is we fail to humble ourselves before the Lord. But he said, if my people, which are called by my name. Have you been called by the name? If we're going to see an apostolic explosion at Peace Tabernacle, we're going to have to humble ourselves before the Lord. We've got to get out of this me mentality and put me into the servant's mentality. I've got to be willing to get down on my hands and knees and grab a hold of my brother's feet and begin to pray for him. And Pray for God to use him and pray for God to anoint him and pray for a powerful move of the Spirit in his life. If we humble ourselves and pray and pray and seek his face, he said, then will I hear from heaven but we, we can't humble ourselves. What, you want me to get down on my hands and knees and pray over his feet, pray over her feet? 
and, 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 and ask God to bless them. No, 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 no. You just don't know who I am. Yeah, I know who you are, Spirit. Your pride. Your arrogance. Your unsubmissiveness. You don't know how to submit to a pastor and you never have. And that's why I feel Paul said he forsaken me. Paul said, Demas, I don't want you to go. I feel like you need to stay right here. Oh, Paul, I got to go. I'm going for this tonight because I just feel that's what God has for me right now. You know, because that's just what I feel. But I'm your pastor, Demas. I'm telling you. you to... No, Paul, now, you know, I've got to go. You know, this is getting scary around here. And, you know, I just, I feel. Let me tell you something. If you feel it and your pastor don't feel it, you have the will of God. That's the way I live it, and that's the way I, I preach it. And yet when we humble ourselves and begin to pray and seek the face of God. The Bible says that people come to the Lord when they're drawn. They're drawn. Sometimes I think we put too much work into building the church. Because if they're drawn by the Spirit, then they'll stay by the Spirit. But if they're drawn by men, the only way they'll stay is by man. And so as long as they get along with man, then they'll stay. But when they first time a preacher preaches something they don't agree with, I'm gone. But if the Spirit of God draws you, and the Spirit of God convicts you, and the Spirit of God saves you. Who are you going to argue with? Hallelujah. <laughs> and so as I'm trying to come to a close this morning with a burden on my heart, I'm asking you to stand to your feet, but at the same time, I'm asking you to bow your head this morning because I feel like we're at a place that if we're not careful, we're going to miss it. And I wonder this morning, I'm opening these altars, is there a mother of Zion that would travail today for revival? Is there someone that would say, you know, I have forsaken the things of God long enough. I am making up my mind today to sell out to the Lord with everything in me. Is there a man of God that says, Pastor, you don't have to worry about worship anymore. I'm going to clap my hands. I may even get out in the aisle and walk about and shout and dance and and carry on like I used to at the football game. But I'm going to praise Jesus with everything within me. I'm going to give him every, I'm going to humble myself to my brother. I'm going to humble myself to my sister. I'm going to pray and believe until we see a move of God. I want revival. I want a move of the Spirit. I'm hungry for a move of God. I'm hungry for a move of the Holy Ghost. Oh, would you pray, church, this morning? Would you pray, young people? I want to, I want revival in our young people. I want my friends in school to be saved today. I'm tired of going to high school and seeing my friends, Lord. I don't know if they're going to live to another year, two years, three years, but help me, Lord, to reach them. I'm on somebody. Would you pray with me this morning? God, save my family. Save my children. Save my grandchildren. Help me, Lord, to be right with you. Help me to humble myself, God. Help me to humble myself, Lord. I want to walk in truth. I want to walk in holiness. I want to walk in righteousness. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it, church. Can we pray?